Kwame on the edge of the box, now waiting. Kiers has done it all himself, and Castrovilli taps home to give Fiorentina the lead. The Calcio Guys is a weekly podcast by Adriano Donardo, Gianni Delacoli, and myself, Nicholas Di Giovanni. We want to bring Calcio back to its roots in our communities and share stories from around the world about why we're passionate about the beautiful game. You can listen to us anywhere where you listen to your podcasts, including Spreaker, Google Podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, and Mixcloud. Give us your opinion on social media at The Calcio Guys on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. The intro song is Fireworks by Jazar. Week one of the city, a yeah, pretty team week, all things considered, except for one classic Italian mix up. Only in Italy, these things happen. And I'm sure most of our listeners know exactly what that is. Here on the couch, with guys with Adriano Donardo, Gianni Delacoli, I'm Nicholas Di Giovanni. Uh, did you guys uh, get to watch a lot of the the first weekend? I, uh, uh, I mean, here, here and there. I, I was uh, I was at work too, so I, I didn't catch everything, uh, you know, to the T. But uh, always, always following. Uh, I always say, when there's a will, there's a way uh, to watch these games and. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was interesting weekend. It was great to be back. Uh, you know, Serie A, we had our preview show last week. It, it was great to get into the swing of things after a short, uh, you know, a short off season, if you want to call it that. So it was great to be back. Uh, you know, Milan on winning ways, and uh, I couldn't be happier. I uh, fortunately we didn't have the strength enough to get <laughs> up early Sunday morning for the Napoli game. Uh, sure. I'm very weak. I apologize to listeners ahead of time, but. Uh, <laughs> I saw that Roma, and I think I probably should, the Roma game, and I think I probably should have slept through the Roma game rather than the Napoli <laughs> game. For real, yeah. The exciting stuff with that game happened afterwards. The <laughs> uh, Roma the getting news. punished because uh, they listed uh, Diawara as an under twenty three player when he is twenty three years old. And... Under twenty two. Under twenty two. Well, under twenty, under twenty three, twenty two, yeah. and under. Yeah, exactly. He, he's 23, so he's not under 23, right? That, that's uh, it. And uh, and because of that, uh, it goes to uh, uh, Verona defaulted, uh, uh, got the win by default, the the three nothing at Tavolino, as uh, the Italians are calling it. And uh, I mean, this shit only happens in Italy. I mean, it's a really bad look on Roma. <laughs> First game in in the Friedkin era. And and this happens, and then on top of it, to add add salt to the wound, it's rumored that Diawara is going to go to Verona. Uh, it oh. I wouldn't uh, like put it as a blame on Roma or Fonseca's fault or anything like that. It was just uh, like I guess it's human error. The best way to describe it, like a lot of people are like, oh, but there's a conspiracy because the guy who submitted the lineup. Is on his way to Verona, which I'll talk a bit more later when we do our yellow card, red card of the week. But yeah. uh, it's I just think it was just a simple mistake. Uh, the issue that was actually more disappointing about the game was the lack of offense from the team. How uh, down the middle you could see that that Roma's weak. Pedro is not a significant replacement. As I don't care what people say, he's just he's just uh, you're trying to put scotch tape to the side of a sinking ship type of thing. <laughs> You know, it's not going to hold too much water. Uh, Deco's coming back, maybe. That's the latest rumor I read on Twitter on the way home tonight. So, um, because apparently uh, they're no longer in talks anymore. So, uh, that would be interesting to see. Uh, Besides that, though, I think the issue more that that, uh, Roma has to look at is that, uh, yeah, that little fiasco happened nonetheless. (laughs) But we, we drew a game that we should have won. In my yeah. eyes, it, yeah. we're not a we're not in a bad position. We're not a, a terrible, terrible position, but we're still a decent enough team. Oh, so. I agree. I think so, I think they had the to, chances. Uh, Adriano, I'm just so, going to interrupt. So it, it's the go, guy who go, go. submitted. It's the guy who submitted the roster that's on his way to Verona. 
Huh? Yes, yes. Because quickly yes, we were yes. talking about it pre-show, and you said, "Oh, he's on his way to to Verona." And, and no, I meant I, uh, Longo, I, I, Longo. Oh, okay, Longo, I thought yeah. it was the Awara. Okay, no, my, I mean, my apologies. Lo- Fick uh, Roberto Luongo uh, <laughs> is going is going the other way apparently. But uh, jo- jokes aside, I mean uh, you, you gotta agree with I gotta agree with Johnny a bit. Uh, you know, not uh, sorry, Roma had the chances. Uh, you know, twenty one shots. Uh, I see here only four on target. That's uh, unacceptable uh, for for you know for Roma for any you know top uh, Serie A club. So, uh, but like Nick said, uh, only in Italy uh, this type of stuff happens. Solo in Italia, uh, you know these these things happen. So. Uh, you know, it, it brings back memories of uh, of the Cagliari, uh, you know, f- uh, milk farmer days where they were keeping the team hostage, and <laughs> uh, you know they couldn't get they couldn't get to that game. So, uh, you know, you just see these little these little things that happen in Italy, and you, you look back and you shrug your shoulders and say only in Italy. But uh, you know, it, it was like Johnny said, it was a disappointing uh, first game. Uh, you know, under the, you know, the freaking era, uh, you know, get, drawing a game where they probably should have taken all three points. Uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, they can't, uh, you know, they, cu- they couldn't submit a lineup properly. So that cost them as well. But, uh, you know, Roma, you know, I, as I said in our preview show, I, I was unsure, uh, you know, about both Roman teams, but I was unsure how, how things would pan out for them. It's not the greatest start, but uh, I think they can recover for sure. It's funny when you say when you say freaking really really fast. It sounds like you're saying freaking great start freaking. to the freaking era. <laughs> freaking era. <laughs> <laughs> Another American owner came into the league. Did you see that uh, Kyle Kraus with uh, yes, sir. with Parma? Parma. Oh, my God, this guy. Stadio blink. come and go. Let's go. Stadio <laughs> come and go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Come and go. Come and go. Owner of come and go. What a name. But did you see the video? Did you see the video he put out uh, to Parma fans? This guy didn't blink the whole video. Yeah, no, I actually I think once. he blinked like three times. And uh, then there was an over under on Twitter. There was an over under. He was like being like, "City ah ah, city ah ah." <laughs> yeah, it was. It was so funny. It was a man. mess. It, it mean, was hilarious. But it, sorry for for Parma. I mean, I, I think they had problems with their past ownership. They've had a, you know, I think uh, they they went down. What was it five years ago now? Because of ownership, and then new ownership came in. They had problems with that. So hopefully for them. Uh, it could bring a bit of a success. We'll talk about their game against Napoli later with uh, Ken uh, Chofredi from the Far From Vesuvius podcast. Um, Juve came out in style. Good strength here from Cristiano Ronaldo. Now Kulisevsky up! 13 minutes into his debut. It is a special moment for Dejan Kulisevsky. Great to see uh, the young kid, Dan Kulusevsky. I read a tweet that is pronounced Kulusevsky, according to, uh, in, in Macedonian, by the way. So I guess we'll, 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 we'll go with that, you know, moving forward, Kulusevsky. And, um, you know, one thing I got to say about Juve. You know, how, you know how at the beginning of the game, they show the coaches, and seeing Pirlo on the sidelines, it was, it was so weird to see at first. It was so weird. But... Looking at this guy, he brings so much class compared to what they had before. Like, like Sadi, you know, okay, I, I know looks are only one thing, and you don't want to insult a man on his looks. But, my God, at the end of the game, this guy was, was sweating from, from parts we didn't even know he could sweat from. You know, it's just, he it wasn't, like, it, it, it didn't fit Los Stilo Juve. And then Pirlo comes in, he's bringing back Morata. You know he's he's bringing back half of the 2015 squad. Storari is coming back as a um, uh, like director role or just a development role. And uh, you know it was ha- I was happy to see I was happy to see him uh, on the sidelines and they played well. Yeah, I think uh, listen, uh, this is game one. Uh, all these games we have to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, you know, week one city I. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's always going to be, you know, a, a challenge. Uh, you know, it's not always, you know, granted, you know, this season is, is a particular year where they had, you know, they've almost played like a couple weeks ago, it almost feels like, you know, so they, they, they really are still in, I would say, some sort of game form. Um, you know, Sampdoria has been struggling, but uh, but yeah, Juve, you know, didn't miss a beat. Uh, it only took the the new guy on the block, Ruzhevsky, uh, 13, 12, 13 minutes uh, to get onto the board, which was exciting because we knew that he uh, he was a, he's a talented young uh, Serie A player. Uh, you know, he showed it at part of my last season. And uh, coming to Juve, I, I, myself personally, looking on the outside in, 
uh, was curious to see how uh, how fast or how slow he would actually be integrated into the squad. And uh, I guess it was positive signs that he was integrated right, right away. Obviously, no Dybala in this game. Uh, maybe had uh, you know could have played a factor into into that decision, but uh, Piro brings a whole new a whole new mix uh, to to Juventus, and uh, we said it from, from from pretty much day one. It's either going to be hit or miss with Pirlo, uh, and you know so far so good. Again, it's still very very early, so I, I wouldn't go uh, you know cheering uh, you know uh, for for you know for every for the tripletto this year, but. Uh, you know, slowly but slowly but sure, I think this team, you know, will, will get molded pretty quickly under Pirlo. Uh, he seems to have, uh, you know, some sort of a vision uh, and the way that he wants to play uh, football at Juventus, uh, bringing back Morata, like Nick said. Uh, I mean, with the whole fiasco of Suarez, uh, Zeko, uh, now Morata comes My back. God. It was like it, it was just a carousel of just names being thrown around uh, for Juventus' number nine uh, position. And um, is it a band solution with Morata? Maybe, uh, maybe not. But uh, I think you know he wa- you know he loves Juve, and I think he knows what it takes to to play for Juventus to wear the the, the Juve jersey. So uh, I think it it'll end uh, pretty well. But uh, again, like Nick said, I agree. Uh, weird to see Pirlo on the sidelines. Uh, you know, posted about it. Uh, him and him and Ronaldo at the end of the game, and all the years back of you know uh, Pirlo against uh, against uh, Ronaldo you know Juve Real Madrid against Milan Real Madrid Italy versus Portugal it was just so weird to see that they would finally be uh, you know coach and and player together so uh, yeah good start for Juve and uh, we'll see how, where it takes them I have uh, an interesting theory to put in so you obviously come out of a uh, disappointing uh, season last year because obviously Juve wants to push Champions League and you fall out in like the earlier rounds. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, everybody hated Sadi, which I don't care if people want to hate Sadi. He's actually a decent coach guy, won uh, a Europa League title. It's not as if he's not capable of winning something. Yeah. Um, I just think that, uh, first of all, he didn't even have the roster that suits his style. So that's unfair to say to him. But I think that Ronaldo probably didn't push to leave Juve because there was obviously those rumors every year. There's always those rumors whenever Juve fails uh, because he respects a guy like Pirlo. And yes, you know, there's the whole thing of like, okay, Sadi, you still have to pay him for cutting him early. And does Juve have, like, mind you, Juve is a top flight team, but you know, nobody has infinite money unless you're a royal family for Manchester City or PSG. But yeah. no, <laughs> jokes aside, like Juve has, as as big as they are, they have a cap, they have a limit. And, you know, everybody said, like, okay, this is the cheap option for them. We'll get a local guy. We'll give him a shot. This is a guy that, that has zero games experience under his belt. So I I strongly believe that that's why they went after Pirlo. But I think there's a little underlying theme here that Ronaldo is obviously the franchise player as of now because it's the biggest name in soccer. So you got you to gotta, uh, you gotta, you piece to him. You know, you got to please the guy. And if a guy like Ronaldo says, I'm not going to respect any manager you hire, but Pirlo comes in, okay, I respect this guy, then that's fantastic. And I think that's probably one of the <coughs> unspoken things as to why Juve went after a guy like Pirlo. Uh, great first win for them. Uh, with, with their, I would, sorry, so I thought something fell here. Uh, I would argue that it's their B squad. Uh, to be fair, like this is not their top roster or their top lineup. Sorry. Um but they still managed to get a 3-0 win against Sampdoria, which is, uh, I guess, a mid-level team. I guess, I guess we can qualify that to be fair. They're a mid-level te- te- uh, team. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, solid win for Juve. It's convincing as Pirlo's first win, too. Yeah, it was definitely weird to see. So, you got now you got Ronaldo, Pirlo, and Morata's back. It just makes me think of the 2015 uh, Champions League semifinal between Real Madrid and Morata. Imagine, imagine like, telling someone back then, that uh, Pirlo would coach Morata and Ronaldo on Juventus. It's, it's, you couldn't uh, even write that script. I'm exactly. Telling you. You and Buffon is still playing. And Buffon is <laughs> still playing. <laughs> he came back. He came back. <laughs> um, okay, other headlines around the city. Uh, Genoa just completely embarrassed Crotone. I mean, like, Crotone made Genoa look like they were a title contender. And now Genoa is first in the league after match day one. We'll see how long that lasts, but... They, they play yeah. Napoli this weekend, so I, I doubt very long. Um, first game of the season was um, Fiorentina-Torino. Uh, Torino, man, they did not look good. Like, 
Salvatore Sirigo, he's the, he's the only thing keeping them right now, you know, between a mid uh, you know, keeping them at a mid table team instead of, um, you know, a relegation team. Um, hmm. Uh, there wasn't I mean, there were there weren't two, uh, as many games as normal, right? Because three games were postponed. Classic Italy for already match day one, and three games are postponed. But uh, Milan, Adriano, your Milan, two nothing. Zlatan, both goals leads the league now in goals. But uh, yeah. no doubt, you know Milan is Zlatan. Zlatan is Milan. You're you're, you're going to hear that all over. But <laughs> is that necessarily a good thing? Because how you know how I see it is one way is. If Zlatan goes down with an injury or something, or he, or he gets cold, who's who's scoring goals? You know, uh, you're obviously going to be happy in the moment that, as long as he's hot, you're happy. But you got to you got to think as you know, is there a backup? Is there other options? You got to spread the offense around a bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, listen, I think uh, with Ibrahimovic, uh, you know, he's. Uh, you know, we know, we know what he can bring on and off the field. Uh, you know, this guy is just uh, insane, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, a la, you know even a la Ronaldo's, uh, you know, Messi's uh, of the world. You know, the, these players, they, you know, they age like fine wine. Uh, you know, he calls himself Benjamin Button. Uh, so, you know, uh, you know, born old, die young kind of thing. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Ibra is, is a fo- big focal point. I think uh, he brings a lot out of this squad. Uh, and he's a reference point uh, for this squad as well. So, uh, there, you know, Milan is a young squad besides uh, besides for Ibrahimovic. Uh, just even in their starting lineup, uh, I don't think anybody's over 25. So, um, you know, it's 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 good in a sense because I still think, you know, keeping uh, Rebic at the club is huge because, uh, you know, in the later part of last year, you know, he, he was solid and he can score a lot of goals. Um, you know, uh, Leao is a young project too, uh, exciting kid too. Uh, you know, obviously he got this whole COVID scare too, but he seems to be, I think, recovering and he, he should be back uh, with the squad soon. Uh, Chalonoglu went, uh, I said it uh, a little while ago, he went from pylon to, to player uh, post-COVID. Uh, you know, he was terrible. Uh, I, I mean, I wasn't a big fan of, of Chalonoglu before, but, you know, he, he stepped up to play, scoring some big goals, uh, getting some assists. So I think... You know, Ibra just brings out so much out of these players that I don't think they had before. Uh, you know, just even confidence uh, in themselves. Uh, and, and again, it's a young squad with Ibra at the helm. I, I think uh, it is a good thing. Uh, you know, is he going to be there forever? No. But, uh, you know, for now, if you can get them back into Champions League, they can, you know, gain some more, uh, you know, funds, can go after other other targets in other transfer windows, and, and you continue to build. It, this is an ever, you know, another project uh, at Milan, but I think, you know, they're in their step in the right direction, and uh, and we'll see how it pans out. I'm, I'm Again, I'm hoping for Champions League, and uh, I still think that without Ibra, uh, you know, they, they, can, they, can, they can manage. You know, will they be at Ibra's level? Maybe not, but I still think, uh, you know, they can get the job done. I think we should note this down as the, the Zlatan generation of Milan. If they keep the same roster for the next Part three two. to five seasons. Part two. <laughs> Part two. But see, but now he's actually the leader, yeah. the role yeah. model, the guy that they're following. Whereas part one, he yeah. was part of the whole puzzle. Now he's yeah. the main piece holding everything together. Um, I'd say that the, the effect of Zlatan Ibrahimovic is something that we should actually focus on three to five seasons after he leaves if Milan keeps the same core just to see the kind of effect that he left on the team. And that's and that's something that uh that's been that I've been saying since day one that he's on the team because he's there to establish them to, to like to gain their confidence to learn how to properly play together. So I uh, can't wait to see uh, not just this current AC Milan, but how the future AC Milan is going to look. Because regardless, uh, I, I, my my friend Massimo Riccio brought up a good point. Shout out to Massimo Riccio. Italy does better when both Milans are really good. And we need both Milans to be really good. Absolutely. Yeah. Just imagine we're starting the season with Cristiano Ronaldo, Zlatan Ibrahimovic. And Leo Messi at Inter, you know what? What a season for the city, right? <laughs> Suarez, Suarez incoming, incoming Ad, Suarez Ad, as well. At Perugia, um, <laughs> he's coming in, fight turns around. <laughs> yeah, yeah, with his McLove, with his McLovin ID card. Yeah, yeah. I, I know you guys saw Italian. that. <laughs> before oh, we man. before we get to our cards, uh, obviously fans in the stadiums, a thousand fans. It was weird to see because all the fans were on one side of the stadiums and they were always on the side of the camera, so you never saw them. It was as if 
it was an empty stadium, and then you'd hear cheers. Like I think I was watching, I think I was when I was watching the Milan <coughs> game. It's like all, yeah. all here, like at one point I just hear these cheers. Like, oh, well, well, what is that? I haven't heard that in a while in a lo- live, uh, you know, sports game, live soccer game. Uh, <laughs> no, good to see a thousand fans. Um, sure. I I think it's until Healthcare October. Workers, they brought. Yeah, October fifth. They're gonna make a decision after. I feel like in these big stadiums, they're gonna allow a bit. I mean, everything you have to deal with it. How the pandemic goes, you know. Exactly. Uh, but listen, but but even look, but look at this. Like in these stadiums that you brought up, these stadiums are like we we were there at Sun Cedar, right? Eighty thousand fans plus yeah. that they can hold for a thousand people to be in that stadium. You can be distant for you know God knows how long, right? So I I think it was it was a, a class act by Milan, you know, bringing the, the healthcare workers, a thousand healthcare workers of the Lombardy region. But uh, I agree with Nick said like these big stadiums, like you know, there, there's room. I I know I saw uh, uh you know going a bit off topic here, but I saw there was a uh, there was a post uh, about maybe potentially for the Napoli Atalanta game, yeah, uh, bringing I about eighteen thousand yeah, people yeah, or yeah, under I twenty thousand people. Yeah. I don't know how true or not true like that it. is, but it was reported today or just before we got on. And um, again, is, is it a good idea? I, I don't know. We're still in this uh, trial and error stage of of bringing fans back to stadiums. So uh, listen, I, I, since we said it from day one, the health is most important. Uh, if they can get the job done, uh, you know, being safe and everything, I think uh, it's the job well done. I'm not a big I'm not a big fan of the Napoli announcement that or. Napoli's uh, sports, uh, was it sports counselor? The tweet that I shared. Um, yeah, somebody. Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, his idea, uh, especially that the second wave is incoming. And as much as we're denying it, that oh, it's one big wave or it's not going to happen. Cases are going up. I could speak. We could speak for North America, like especially Quebec and Ontario specifically. Oh yeah. Um, cases have been going up day by day. Uh, not sure how Europe is going to be handling it, but. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're going to have to go through a second wave as well and uh, reopen up these stadiums. Yes, you want to open up to the fans. You want to want to return to some normality. But I don't think you should just dive into the waters. This is something that you should tiptoe into, you know, integrate it slowly, you know, yeah. like go from like 1% capacity. And then after a month, try a quarter, maybe 15% capacity. And then later on, you know, uh, maybe by next year, if things happen to die out, then you can push to 80 plus percent in terms of capacity. But for now, don't dive into like those big numbers right away. It's, it's, it's a huge risk. Absolutely. Uh, For me personally, like I, I wouldn't mind if it just remains closed until the end of pandemic, you know, I'd rather, you know, I'd rather have, you know, part of me says I'd rather have zero fans than a thousand fans. And then, and then when we can, we get all 40,000 fans, 50,000 fans in the stadiums. But, you know, I understand it, and it is a nice touch, you know. So uh, as long as people are safe, and as long as the, you know, players are safe too. Um, yeah. Okay, cards. Let's do our cards. We haven't done this in a while. The yellow card, red card segment is back. <laughs> we'll give out one card each, and then we'll do our MVPs. Um, who wants to start? Uh, I'll start. Okay. Take it away. Yeah. So we'll start off with. The biggest winner of the week for my yellow card, <laughs> Pantaleo Longo. Wow, you even got me saying Luongo now. Yeah, Pantaleo Longo. Longo. Uh, man submits a roster and quote-unquote makes an error with Diawara. Um, it's too much to get into the whole conspiracy thing. Like, By the way, like I know I like, I like to bug Nicholas and stuff about Juventus and conspiracy and stuff because it's just fun to meme about it. It honestly is. <laughs> you have to admit, it's fun to get a laugh out of it, you know? Especially with the whole Suarez cheating in Italian uh, exam. <laughs> hey, I'm well, sorry, more on but... that later. More on that later. Yeah, but like, you, you know, you have to be off the wall yeah. <laughs> to really start believing all these things to be real, especially the smallest things. Like, I'm not talking about Cacciopoli. Like, I'm talking about like, Oh, he got his answers ahead of time. Oh, this guy was doing it to screw over Roma. Like, you could say that it's like that because it looks bad because the man's going to Hellas Verona now, you know, because he accepted a job there. But it's also could be slated as human error. Uh, you know, I just think it, you'd be crazy or going, you would go ballistic if you believed that he did it purposely. Oh. So, uh, purposefully, but yeah. like, uh, whatever the word is, I really can't think anymore. It's been a long day for me. Uh, but long story short, he gets my yellow for making the stupidest mistake in the world. Costing this us the draw. is definitely going to be another yellow. Adrian. 
Yeah, for me, I mean, I, I knew Johnny was going to go for, for, for that. Uh, if Johnny wasn't going to pick it, I think either me or Nicholas was, were going to take it. But uh, <laughs> I definitely agree with everything Johnny said. Can't make them. This is like, again, like Manchini forgetting his glasses. There's another, <laughs> another, another <laughs> following Daria moment, you know. So, uh, I mean, I swear to God. But um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to go with my uh, yellow card as well. Uh, nothing, I guess, too, too crazy. But uh, I'm going to go back to the Sassuolo Cagliari game. Um, just just the amount of shots uh, that were taken uh, by Sassuolo. Uh, 33 shots I have here, maybe even 34. It wasn't only nine on target, one goal. It was a 1-1 draw in that game. Uh, for me, unacceptable. I mean, you, you know, you're, you have one of the uh, last season, one of, one of the better strikers, maybe underrated strikers, Chicho Caputo, our boy. Uh, you know, uh, leading the line over there. That you know, Sassuolo had a good campaign last season. Starting off the game uh, against, I think, a, a good Cagliari team. I think they'll have a good campaign uh, this year. Uh, Giovanni Simeone also on the board in that game. Um, but yeah, just uh, not converting on chances. You know, you have you, you shot you shoot the ball 33 times, 34 times, whatever the case is. Uh, nine of them only on target, and you had you know almost 70 percent possession and get only one goal out of it, it's a little suspect for me. Again, nothing too serious, but uh, if they want to you know, prove to be uh, better than last season and, and improve this year, they're going to have to be more clinical for sure. Uh, I understand it's only game one, but uh, I'm going to have to give a small yellow card uh, to that performance by Sassuolo. It's a late challenge, surely maybe the first yellow of the match. So mine's going to go to another only in Italia moment with uh, <laughs> Mr. Luis Suarez. Uh, taking his Italian exam last week in Perugia and then uh, yeah. being accused of cheating on it uh, because his <laughs> teachers gave him the answers beforehand. And and I think the best part out of all of this, so obviously Suarez was rumored to go to Juve, but, you know, I think by the time he took the exam, you know, Dzeko was already the number nine, you know, so he had, you know, in the, in the carousel of Juve's number nine, it was Dzeko by the time he took the exam. Yeah. And the best part is... is the government official who came out with the story, who who discovered the cheating, the guy's last name was Sadi. His last name was Sadi. <laughs> you can't, I swear, the, you can't script this. And in the press conference, he had to say he's not related to Maurizio Sadi. Like this is <laughs> this is only in Italy. You know, I'm not going to talk about the cheating. Whatever. It, I think it's, I think that part's the best. How it, it, it's just such a big deal, you know, and. Oh my God! It, it's it's just so much like transfer saga over a transfer that never happened. It's not like he ever came to Italy. Um, I think you know maybe maybe it would have made his transfer to Atletico. That's where he ended up going a bit easier if he had a European passport, this and that. But a lot of mm-hmm. documentation, so I don't know if that yeah. happened. Uh, but just a ridiculous, ridiculous situation. And uh, he now sees a flash of yellow before his eyes. Okay, quickly before we have uh, Ken on MVPs, we'll do a. You we'll, want to take we'll, it away? We'll go, let's go reverse order then. I'll, I'll give my MVP to. Uh, I'll give my MVP to uh, Kulusevski just for uh, scoring on his debut. Turned out to be the winning goal too. Pretty nice goal. And man, this guy scores scores a first goal for for a big club. Didn't even have a smile on his face. And I, 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 yeah. I part of me likes that mentality. Part of me says, man. Put a smile on your face. You just scored a goal. And, you know, I think he's just focused. And, uh, you know, it was good good to see him uh, start his Juve career like that. Yeah. No, I, I mean, again, like I said, you know, took him only 13, 12, 13 minutes to get on the board. The no celebration. Uh, you know, he's got a, he's got a, he's got a lot of character, Kulusevski. And, and I think he, he'll do just fine. But I guess I'll go with uh, another Swede. Uh, you know, in the league, I, I, I was going to I was going to say Ibrahimovic uh, Zlatan, uh, you know, from the get go, uh, you know, the, the two goals uh, that we spoke about before, just his presence on and off the pitch uh, for Milan. Uh, this might not be the first time I give Ibra uh, an MVP nod this season. But uh, again, he, he's just so important. Uh, you know, you got the, you got the first heading goal off the, um, off the uh, Teo Hernandez cross and you got the PK. A goal as well and it's like you you look at the score and it's like oh yeah Zlatan scored it's like of course he did uh he's just that he's just that he's just that player right uh and uh you know just fantastic I was, at first I was gonna give it to 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 Genoa it seemed like uh I was gonna uh, I might have to I was like thinking I was like should I give it to Genoa maybe I'm gonna have to change my whole prediction not make them get relegated please Fabrizio <laughs> all in one like this all through my head I was going through but at the end of the day I went for with my heart again 
uh, you know, for Zlatan, and uh, he gets my MVP this week. Ibrahimovic waiting for the cross. There it is! And inevitably, Zlatan Ibrahimovic first off the mark for Milan. Or that. De- I, I just told Adriano quickly. I was thinking about uh, giving it to uh, Zapacosta for his yeah, sweet or goal, de- actually. Or, or Destro. Destro came back. Yeah, the, the, man, I, I forgot the, this guy was with Genoa. Yo, you see that nice slick hair, yeah. too? He had a kid. <laughs> I think he, had, he did the baby celebration. It was, yeah. it was a good, big, big moment for Genoa. Jenny? Mattia Destro. That's a name I haven't heard in a long time. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> That's one of my favorite quotes from Star Wars. <laughs> Obi-Wan. That's the name I haven't heard in a long time. Anyways, I'm getting off topic. <laughs> Uh, my MVP, I see that continuing on with the theme with uh, choosing players from our teams. Uh, I'm going to go with Osimhen for uh, for my MVP of the week. He did not do anything directly, <laughs> but the moment he stepped on the field, uh, you saw the tides of battle change completely. Uh, now you added a third threat on the front line for Napoli, and you saw Parma's defense is like, do we cover Insigne? Do we cover Mertens? Do we cover Osimhen? Who do we get? And just because of Osimhen being there and being that dangerous because of his speed, you have to respect that, that he can get into a dangerous area so quickly. It opened up so much plays. And if you look at the goal scored, Insigne was open, Mertens was open, there was nobody on them. And all, in all those plays, the defense was all over Osimhen because why? He was in those high danger areas. And uh, I think he assisted on the Mertens goal, if I'm not mistaken, because um, the because the Insigne goal, he no, sorry. He insisted on the Insigne goal, not the Mertens goal. Because the Mertens goal, it wasn't him that headed it towards Mertens. It was the defender. But he was heading it out of the way because Osimhen was right there. And the man's pretty tall, too. He's pretty tall, too. So he, Especially he's compared to Mertens right and Insigne. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, for his first 20 minutes, uh, 30 minutes, uh, 20, uh, 20, 30 minutes, 20, 25 minutes in the Napoli jersey, uh, I have to give him MVP of the week for just his fantastic showing. So that's a perfect uh, transition. We're going to have uh, Kenjo Freddy on uh, from far from Vesuvius podcast just uh, just after this break. It's a good ball towards Aussie man. Now Mertens! Dries Mertens gives Napoli the lead. The ball dropped kindly. Lozano, Lozano on goal. And the tap in from Insigne. Goal number two for Napoli. Welcome back to the Calcio guys. Joining us now is Ken uh, Chofredi from Far From Vesuvius podcast. You just heard there the Mertens and Insigne goals from their 2 nothing win over Parma on the weekend. Uh, Ken, how's it going? Yo, what's up, guys? It's going good. You know, start a, start season off with a win and, you know, got to feel good going into the next week. So happy to be on with you guys. Good to meet y'all. And, uh, yeah, ready to talk some Napoli. Beautiful. Be- before before we get started, what we like to do with our with our uh, guests, we, we want to know how you became you know Napoli fan, a Napoli fan, how you became passionate about uh, Napoli, and then also how you became involved with the the Far From Vesuvius podcast. Sure, yeah. So I mean, my immediate family is not very into calcio or football or soccer, depending on where you guys are listening from. But uh, most of my family is from Naples. So uh, around the time I was maybe 21, 22 years old, uh, Napoli were just coming back up through uh, Serie C and Serie B uh, after being reformed through De Laurentiis. And I got a little bit interested. And after they got into Serie A, I just got hooked. And ever since then, it's been... Uh, I guess the, the you know the re- the rest is, is history, I guess, as you would say. You know, I'm, now it's... You know, we have the podcast. Uh, I went to the Sao Paulo for the first time in 2018 and got to see them play Roma, which was an awesome experience. And I sat in the Corva B with some friends and it was, you know, one of those experiences that you never forget. So it it really started maybe back in 2007, 2008. And it's been it's been a steam train since then. So it's 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 been a lot of fun. And the podcast actually so Far From Vesuvius was actually born from another podcast uh, called Sempre, which was an Napoli podcast that was around for a few years. And uh, I was involved with them as well. And the host, uh, original host, James, sort of left. He had a family and, you know, just didn't have time for it anymore, really. So uh, me and Rafa sort of and Marco and Kirsten sort of took 
what was left from that decided to rebrand it as far from Vesuvius. And that was about two years ago now. So yeah, wow. that's, that's, that's the story of far from Vesuvius. And now we're going into our third season as far from Vesuvius. So it's, it's exciting and we love to cover the team and, you know, it's passionate and it's good. And Calcio Twitter is pretty awesome. So uh, it's, it's <laughs> become sure. a really awesome thing. I, I first got involved with, uh, Napoli Twitter, maybe uh, I want to say 2010, 2011, uh, and there was only maybe four or five of us Napoli fans <laughs> on Twitter then, so uh, that were speaking English anyway. So it, it's, it's been quite the transformation over the last decade to see five or six of us turn into you know a fair amount of us. So it's 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 been fun and exciting, and and I'm glad to be a part of it still. So it's it's nice. Beautiful. And first off, congratulations on you know three years with the You're Far From Vesuvius podcast. It's uh, you guys do great work over there, and uh, we're a fan uh, over here in Montreal. So uh, just want to shout you guys out. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. You know, we, we, we love you guys also. I know Rafa was on last season, and, you know, me and Rafa are, yeah. are good buds. So it's it's good. And once – I mean, I, me and, and my wife and me personally, we go we go up to Montreal pretty often because uh, we Beautiful. live in Boston. So, go know, Bruins. When, uh, well, I'm from New York originally, so I'm a Rangers fan. But oh God, no! Get out. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know what's worse from you guys from Montreal. If I'm a Bruins fan or a Rangers fan, um, so Bruins, <laughs> Boston, Boston. But um, but yeah. So once you know, once travel is a cool thing again, you know, we'll definitely be back up there because I I love Montreal so much. Uh, we've been maybe ten times in the last wow. six or seven years. We we adore it. So we'll we'll be back up for. For some for some bagels and and some good food, so <laughs> that's what we like to hear. Who knows? Maybe we can catch a game all together if there's like a Napoli, yes. I don't know, Milan or Napoli Juve game. Yo, we're gonna you know? have to make it happen, sure. Ken. Uh, Johnny's been salivating over here to get this <laughs> meeted up in Philly or something, something going yeah, on. Yeah. I don't know if you guys can see yeah. that happen also, but I mean, we, uh, again, once travel is happening, uh, we, we got to make it a plan. Yeah, for sure. We did it last year in Michigan. We uh, yeah, Napoli played Barcelona. We were able to throw something together, and you know, we all met at a beer garden. There was like thirty of us there, uh, or thirty-five of us there. It was it was a pretty amazing experience. So I'm always down to get a bunch of Calcio fans together and and have a good time. Yeah, I just want to say uh, I listen to you guys very often. Uh, fantastic podcast. Uh, I love the stories that Rafa told last year when we uh, when we had it. Well, last year, this summer, technically. Um, <laughs> and speaking of last season, a team that we always had difficulty with was Parma for some reason for, over another. Uh, yeah. But now we started the first game with a W against them. Yeah. And it wasn't looking like it was going to be one, but until until we got one towards the last third of the game. What are your thoughts about the Napoli-Parma game? Uh, I mean, hey, one, I'm happy we got the result. Uh, obviously, yeah, it was, a, it was a bogey side for us last year where they, we got two losses against them last year so definitely good to get out of the blocks with a win i thought the first half was uh to put it to put it nicely wasn't very good uh it was just a little stagnant and once we brought osimen on the game changed completely it was a completely different game he changed the game he changed the dynamic of the team uh we switched the shape from a 4-3-3 to a 4-2-3-1 and it unlocked the whole game for us i mean he was involved directly in one goal and indirectly in another. Um, so it was great to see him get off to such a great start. I was really, really, really pleased with how he played. I th also thought, uh, given the opportunity that Lozano played really well uh, this past weekend, yep. he he showed some determination, some grit. I, I thought he, he controlled the play well. And once we changed that 4-2-3-1, him and Osimhen seemed to have a little bit of a thing going on, which is awesome. Uh one thing that didn't happen that almost was, was Osimhen flicked the ball with his head and almost went in, but Lozano was making a run to the back post. And I was like, these guys are really, really in sync with each other. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how we line up against Genoa this weekend. But, I mean, overall, we have a clean sheet. We win 2-0. You know, the the captain and, and, and Chiro Mertens get on the score sheet, and Osimhen plays well. I'm not going to be – not going to complain or nitpick too much aside from that. No, absolutely. I can uh, I think you nailed it on the head. Uh, you know, you spoke a, a lot about Osimhen there, and uh, our next question was, uh, you know, Osimhen based. Uh, but what, how happy are you uh, to see, uh, you know, the young Nigerian uh, integrate into the squad uh, so early on? You know, getting 
getting uh, like along with uh, Insigne, uh, Mertens, like these guys are taking him under, you know, their wing and uh, and showing him the ways. Uh, he seems to already love Naples, uh, and Naples hopefully already uh, you know loves OC Man. And uh, I'm I'm personally, I mean, again, looking from the outside in, I'm I'm personally a fan of OC Man. I know Johnny uh, is as well, and and Nick can appreciate his talent as well. But uh, what do you make of of Victor OC Man coming to Napoli? Uh, instant impact, like you said, directly and indirectly. And uh, what's what does the future hold uh, for for Osiman? I mean, this is what's crazy is this is a type of signing that that I don't think you can have on a radar for Napoli to make. Uh, yeah. You know, if if eight months ago or six months ago, even someone said, "Hey, Napoli are gonna buy a striker for eighty million euros," you would have been like, "What? <laughs> Ooh. Are you crazy? <laughs> That's never gonna happen." And and obviously the process was long and drawn out, and there was a whole saga just just the way De Laurentiis likes it. And <laughs> but I think I mean he he came into camp ready. He seemed to be ready to hit the hit the ground running. He's acclimated himself to the city really well. It seems like he has gotten along very well with. I mean, it seems like he mentioned it right away that that Mertens really was someone who was important to him integrating early on and and Mertens has now become and you see with other players too as they come in Mertens has become sort of this this sort of ambassador for for not only the club but the city and I think a player like him is really important to have it and I'm that's why I'm part of the reason why I'm so happy that that he extended his contract because he really does sort of usher these guys in and make them feel comfortable and it's and a player like Osimhen is a player that we, unlike we've had in a long time. I mean, he not only can he he bang goals in, but the way he stretches play. I mean, there, there was there was a clip on Twitter earlier this week, right after the game, of how he creates space and he starts a ball is coming over the top and he says he's five meters behind the defender and he ends up just in the flight of the ball from going five meters behind the defender to one meter in front of the defender and those are the types of line breaking runs that we haven't had somebody be able to make in a long time. And I think, I mean, yeah, I'm gonna try not to, you know, overhype him because I, I, I don't want to be that guy who's like, oh, this guy's the best player in, in Serie A, whatever. But he has the ability to be a very important player for for us, and I think that him coming into the situation here in in Naples is also going to ease him in. He doesn't have the pressure of being the only option. He still has Mertens, who obviously still has. Uh, a knack for goal. We have Pitania who's here to sort of be another striker that can change the looks. We don't have to solely depend on him, which I think is really important for a, someone who's 21 years old and coming in on, on a huge fee. I, I know other uh, Napoli podcasts and other people out there said that, you know, it, it was a huge, it, it's an embarrassment that he didn't start. But I think, you know, whether a player costs 5 million or 80 million, you, you have to, make sure that these guys are ready to play, especially at that age. And he also hadn't played a competitive game since March. So it's yeah. not like League 1 was done after COVID. They, they didn't come back. So he he, he needs time. And I, I do think he'll start this weekend against Genoa. Um, but, yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed with him. And I, I really think that, you know, if he can keep it going, he could be a really special player for us. And, you know, it's just an exciting type of player to have. Uh, just want to quickly add to uh, what you said about the whole Mertens being an ambassador. I think another X factor for him coming was Koulibaly because he spoke a lot with him. And, you know, at, to call a spade a spade, Koulibaly is one of Af- the continent of Africa's like greatest p- yeah. greatest players right now. And to have a big name like that, you know, on this team, somebody who's, I guess, he's not a fellow countryman, but somebody who's, who's let's say, facing the same challenges as you are, sure. makes a big difference, especially if he's telling you, no, you'll be welcomed here, you know, so it helps. Absolutely. There's no doubt about the fact that having someone else to sort of reassure you in, in that type of way has to have gone a, a long way in, into making sure that he felt comfortable here. And and I think Naples is one of those cities where the, you can be welcomed very easily. And you see, you know, players just rave about, you know, how they're embraced by the city and how they're embraced by the fans. And you see even a player who is not even probably going to play for Napoli this year in Llorente does not want to leave the city at all. He just wants, I mean, he doesn't, he's not really going to play for us, but he just wants to chill and hang in Naples because it's a great city and they love him. (laughs) I don't blame him at all. (laughs) Uh, 
So, Ken, one, one of the questions we got on uh, on social media, sticking with OC Men and, and an, another striker that Napoli bought, uh, Petania, uh, six, six side Calcio, they asked, um, do you see a scenario where Napoli p- potentially uses both Petania and OC Men at the same time? We saw it at the end of the game last week. Um, they switched to sort of a flat 4-4-2 at the end of the game, just when we were icing it. I mean, the game was over at yeah. that point for all intents and purposes. But one thing that has impressed me so far from preseason through now with, with Gattuso and the way that he's sort of set this team up is that he's come out sort of ready to use tactical flexibility and not just be married to a 4-3-3 or a 4-2-3-1 or whatever. He's going to use the game and see the opponent and sort of adjust to what works best. And I think we, I mean, we saw it last week and it worked great. It went from a 4-3-3 which was okay, I went for, to a 4-2-3-1, and I think that will work against weaker opponents. In Serie A, I don't think that against the bigger teams we'll be able to do a 4-2-3-1. I think we'll have to go 4-3-3. But I think you, there is scenarios where you're going to see that 4-4-2, especially if I could see a late-game scenario where we're chasing a game and we need a goal that you're going to see Osimhen and Patania together. And Patania seems like a very selfless player. Uh, already, even from just the one preseason game he played and the 10 or so minutes he played the other day. I, I'm not going to be – I'll be the first one to admit that when I, I thought this was going to be a signing that was going to be very much like our signing of Roberto Inglese, where we bought him, loaned him out, and then sold him at a profit a year later. And I just didn't think he would be able to fit into this team. But – I think that it might work. And I think that if these guys can all play well with each other and there's not drama between who's playing and starting each game, if they can truly work together and be, you know, a three striker unit with Mertens, Osimen, and Patania, it could really tactically be an advantage for us that not many other teams in Serie A have. So speaking about one target man and moving on to another so-called target <laughs> man, <laughs> I know uh, I know I, I know you guys already spoken ex- exhaustively about him on uh, the Far from Vesuvius podcast, and you guys had some choice words about him, which I don't disagree. <laughs> with. Uh, this question comes from Roma dot English. They ask, where should Millet go? Because obviously, you know, he's not going to he's not going to be playing for us anytime soon. He's probably just going to be rotting his entire season with us, but. <laughs> Where should Millet go, and do you think they should give him another chance or just release him in case they're not able to sell him? They should release him into the Bay of Naples is where they should release him. <laughs> uh, but honestly, I don't care where he goes, I, truthfully. I don't care if he goes. I don't care. It's obviously not going to work out. I think that for a long time I was a very much a sympathizer of, of Milik. But the way that he's conducted himself this offseason, to me, is embarrassing for a player. To try to strong arm a team into getting you to be sold to the team you want to go to, which just happens to be one of our biggest rivals, is not okay with me. He, I said it on Far From Vesuvius, and I'm happy to say it here again. He, <laughs> I think his plan all along from when Saudi left is that I'm going to write out my contract, and right at the end I'm going to rejoin Saudi wherever he is. And when he went, when Saudi went to U of A, I thought – he was thinking probably, great, I'll go another year and I'm going to try to sign with U of A and I'll be with Saudi and everything will be perfect. Obviously, Saudi gets fired. And now Milik is still trying to push for U of A. U of A say, we don't, we don't want you, essentially. And then whatever happened with, with Roma, and I, I don't really know the specifics of what happened, something about maybe some there was rumors that maybe something about his medical and then they denied it. And then something to do with him trying to fight us over some fines from that mutiny last year. But I really don't care if he, the hot rumor now is that he's on, there were in talks to go to Tottenham. And if he goes to Tottenham, great. If he goes anywhere, I don't care. I don't care if we loan him out to, you know, whoever, it doesn't matter to me as long as he's off the team. I mean, if he wants to play hardball and sit on the bench all year, and then go on a free next year, that's up to him. But I know he doesn't want to because he's going to want to play in the Euros. So that's he keeps point. saying he'd be happy to sit on the bench, but I don't think he will. <laughs> I think he wants to play in the Euros. I know he won't start because, you know, Poland has another striker that's decent. But <laughs> <laughs> but I think he'll at least get a shot to play. Um, I mean, I know in the in the last round of friendlies, he didn't even start the games and, and Piontek started the games. So that tells you where his level of play is at. So. 
I mean, I'm happy to see him go anywhere, and I just think his time with Napoli is done. So I'll be happy to say good riddance to him when when he finally does sign somewhere else. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think uh, you know, who even knows where he is. You know, <laughs> Mio, he's like a ghost right now. Is he is he on the way out? Is he staying on the bench? Who knows? You know. Yeah, Gattuso's basically said he knows our stance. He we tried to resign him. He didn't want to, and he's not in yeah. that. So. That that's it exactly, and uh, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't try to cross Gattuso, so uh, because no. uh, he, he he'll give it to you. So, um, <laughs> but uh, but Ken, moving on, um, moving on to I, I think we can go from one side of the spectrum of a player that you don't care where they go to maybe another side of the spectrum where I think he's pretty important. Uh, I believe this question or comment was was on uh, the the post that either you or or the the far from the Soviet page had posted, but uh, uh, Rosati20 on Twitter, uh, can't we just keep Koulibaly? Uh, it seems uh, more likely now, there was reports uh, you know, before we got on, that um, you know, Man City is out of the race, apparently, to, to sign Koulibaly or to, to, to negotiate for Koulibaly. Uh, I, again, I think we've said it many times on this podcast, uh, you know, he's very important to Napoli. Yes, he can go for a lot of money, they can you know, you know, spend elsewhere, but for me personally, I still think he's he's an important part of this uh, this club and and this city. Uh, like we said before, uh, just want to know your thoughts. Uh, do you want Koulibaly in, Koulibaly out? Is uh, is this a good sign uh, that, that Koulibaly can uh, can be staying with Napoli? I think I think that I think now I think that he stays. Truthfully, I, I don't think that any team is going to be able to table the offer that De Laurentiis wants. And yeah. Koulibaly is not pushing the league. Uh, so that's a big difference over some of our other big sales in the past where the players have pushed to leave and move on with their careers and, and go for that, whatever top tier team, as you say, like, you know, I think that right now, if, if I'm putting odds on it, I think it's probably 70, 30 that he stays. I know PSG is really the only team that's, that's left in the hunt. And I don't know if they're going to be able to table the, the proper offer. De, De Laurentiis, won't sell for less than what he thinks he think he's worth, um, which apparently is somewhere between seventy five and eighty million. Um, yeah. And also, just a sidebar: Manchester City can get out of here. I, the way that they <laughs> out a boy can out a boy. The, the way that the way that they conducted the negotiations for the transfer is is a disaster. They they were they're mad at us over the Jorginho transfer a couple of years ago because they thought they had him locked up, and then Chelsea offered more money, so we sold him to Chelsea. And now they won't come to the table to talk to us directly. So they're going through Koulibaly's agent to mediate between Napoli and Man City. So I'm happy they backed out of the race. Good riddance. Yeah. Good luck with whoever you guys signed. I think they were going after that kid Kunde from Sevilla. Great. Uh, and Koulibaly played great on the weekend. So hopefully... If we said this last year and it didn't really come off because Manolas and Koulibaly both were fighting injuries and it just didn't just didn't click well. But if those two guys, if Koulibaly stays and those two guys can get on the same page, Scary. that's a pretty darn good center back pair as your first pair. Agreed. And Maximovic last year played really well too. And they just signed uh, Ramani uh, from Hellas and he's there now as a fourth center back. So if it stays like that, that's a pretty good. Uh, group of center backs and I, I I hope that he stays I think right now as it stands he will stay you know these things change on the flip of a coin so who knows what the next I think two weeks we have or a week and a half or whatever it is left in the transfer market yeah. so I hope he stays because he, he he's one of those players that I mean I said it with Mertens too but he's another player that's really been an ambassador for the city and and you know he's he said it last year in uh, in a in a great amazing article. If anybody hasn't read the article he put out for the Players Tribune last year, uh, you should read it. It's amazing. Uh, it just talks about his history and and he's really grown to love Naples. Both of his children have been born in Naples, so he he, he doesn't want to leave. And ADL won't sell him for a premium, so I do think that he stays. Absolutely, I, t- I agree. And quickly, just to, to bounce off of that, I, like you said, Ken, uh, there's not enough time. I don't even think you know the the transfer window closes what the beginning of October, and uh, like you said, uh, we can have two yeah. weeks. So, for a big money move like this to happen in a small period of time, with all negotiations and everything, paperwork and everything that needs to be said and done, 
I just personally don't even think there's enough time uh, for, for that big move uh, to happen. And then to, on top of it, to find a suitable replacement uh, for Koulibaly, uh, yeah. you know, for Napoli. So I, I agree 100%. And I think the fact that the Lorenz is like, oh, you want Koulibaly? Well, this is his price tag. No more, no less type uh, or no less type of thing. And it, it, it kind of like shows Koulibaly that, hey, I'm appreciated and valued here. So I'm less likely to want to leave too. Uh, but that uh, like that beautiful back line, as you were mentioning, still has that one enigma, which is the left back. And that's been our biggest here enigma we, for the past three, here four we seasons. Go. <laughs> but I, I'm not gonna get onto the whole. Uh, I'm, I'm doing, doing baby. I'm, and stuff. Well, I'm so here. I'm in the minority here. Oh, but well. I hot take. Hot quite take hot, on the culture guy. Actually, <laughs> I would venture to say that in the last eighteen months, <laughs> Mario Rui has been a at minimum a top five left back in Serie A. Yeah, he's even bringing not much specific. Eighteen months, he said, Johnny. That's a specific, so he's, he's on top of this. <laughs> I, yeah, but uh, to be fair, like not 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 trying to disrespect Ken here, but is there even any competition though to be a left back in Italy? Let's be honest. Yeah, of course. Hey, <laughs> Teo Hernandez, there's, there's, uh, there's, Alessandro, Robin Gosens. That's already three. Teo, okay. Yeah, Teo is the. I think Teo is the best. Sa- Sandro second. I, I would put Mario Rui third. Wow. Okay. I, he is not perfect by any means. <laughs> and he can make mistakes. Yeah. But with with the the shape that Napoli plays now, I think he was more exposed with Ancelotti and I we can have a whole other podcast about my thoughts post mortem about Napoli under Ancelotti. But <laughs> the way that they play, Di Lorenzo stays further back. And Mario Rui sort of moves moves forward more, and, and he's got a he actually does have a really good partnership with Insigne down the left. Going forward, Mario Rui is very good. Defending is adequate, <laughs> but it can be adequate when you have Koulibaly next to you. So he might be getting a little bit of a benefit. Obviously, he's getting a huge benefit. Let's not mince words. He's getting a big benefit from Koulibaly being next to him, but I think he's been good. I think. Whenever we start Hisai at left back, that's when I get nervous because he's playing on his off foot. I mean, Gulam must be just completely useless because if Hisai is playing on his offside, then we have a problem. <laughs> but yeah. I went to, I was in a whole long chat today about Mario Rui and our fullback situation and how can we get another fullback in. And the truth right now is that we have five fullbacks on the books and – Three of them at least aren't going anywhere because you have your two starters in, in Rui and Di Lorenzo. Gulam is apparently untransferable because of his wages or whatever. And then you have Malqui who's just coming off an ACL. And, you know, then you have Hisai. So until we move somebody, these are our guys. So yeah. <laughs> If you like it or not, if you like it or not. If you like it or not. Um, so I started a bit of a hype train today with our friends from Scudetto Pod, and they asked us this question, and uh, I'm going to repeat Let's it word it. for word. I already know it. Let's go. <laughs> we have a dream. Will you join us in our quest to lobby Messi to go to Napoli when his contract expires in order to emulate Diego? This has to happen. And I started with the whole, we sign Messi or we riot. And then it's like, no, sign Messi and we riot. <laughs> so what do you think? I mean, listen. <laughs> No one would be happier than than any of us on Far From Vesuvius if we wake up next summer and Leo Messi is in our lap, obviously. I mean, I think the chances of this happening are... Slim to none. Yeah, Slim to none is saying it nicely. <laughs> I would say... I would wager a fair amount of coin that he there's no way that this ever happens. Uh, uh, you know, unless Messi, Messi is feeling gracious and wants to come play for peanuts. You know, in comparison to what he's making now, obviously, if this did happen in the fantasy world that I'm going to live in for the next few minutes, uh, <laughs> it would obviously change the scope of Napoli as a team completely. Um, you know, it would just change everything. Even Messi at 34 years old would change, or 33 or whatever he'll be next season, uh, would change. You know, the whole scope of everything. All our expectations would obviously also drastically change because I think then you're saying. Okay, this is the team that's going to win the Scudetto the following season. 
So maybe maybe then in that in that situation, you know, Napoli will finally be able to to to, to break the duck here, and and that would be, I mean, the poetry would just be so beautiful, wouldn't it? Juve win this season and it's ten in a row, and in comes Leo Messi to take Ronaldo out and put Napoli <laughs> back at the top of Serie A. I mean, it would be a beautiful, beautiful story, but. Unfortunately, I think that it will live in the fiction section of the library. <laughs> you yeah, can do it in FIFA. Yeah, That's exactly. right. Do it in FIFA. Get get that that uh, financial takeover. Grab them and, and do it yourself. It's probably <laughs> as close as you'll get. <laughs> but just just quickly, quickly, but it's still in hypothetical land in this part of the you know the the library. Uh, would he would he wear the number ten? I think. I, I mean, he for. Uh, I might also be in the minority here. I don't. <laughs> I, I don't like. I don't like the retired number. I'm okay. not a big fan of it. Okay. I, and before Napoli was reformed, and even after Napoli were reformed, other players wore the ten. So, I think it, I think that it would have if if Messi came in this in you know this alternate reality. Yes, I think there's no <laughs> doubt that he wears the ten. I think Diego comes out. Gives him his blessing, and then, you know, Messi is is you know revealed to a full San Paulo wearing the number ten. I don't think there's any way he he doesn't if if that happens. Fair, fair, fair enough. Uh, okay, I, I, again, Ken's in the minority tonight, uh, but he brings some good points. So, uh, you know, I, we definitely we definitely respect that. But uh, you know, like we touched a bit on uh, before, Ken, uh, obviously Napoli does play Genoa uh, coming up next game. Um, what do you just quick thoughts maybe on on the game? Uh, what do you think a Tuzo and also what do you think a Tuzo is going to bring uh, bring to this game? You, we were mentioning a bit before maybe Osimhen starts. Um, how do you how do you see Catuzo uh, taking this game uh, against uh, Genoa coming up uh, this weekend? And 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 by the way, that was it was kind of a question that we got on social media from our friend Vito from uh, Genoa Club Toronto. I love how he worded it. He just wrote, "Let's talk about Napoli Genoa." Yeah, anything to get Genoa <laughs> in. Uh, so, so Ken, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, listen, Genoa had a really impressive performance uh, this past weekend. Big time. Granted, I think Crotone is really bad. <laughs> really, really bad. Um, and I'm not trying to disrespect Genoa. Anytime Goran Pandev scores a worldie, I'm excited. <laughs> that's, <laughs> you know, it, that, that's it, that's uh, it. You know, this, how old is he now? 38, 37, 38? I, I mean... He wasn't with Napoli for too long, but I but I think we a lot of us fans really took to him. So I do like to see him succeeding still at Genoa, and, and uh, you know they got off to they got off to a great start, a four one win, and you know that's pretty impressive. But I do I think Gattuso goes a little bit more aggressive from the start. I think we go four two three one this week. Uh, I think Osimhen starts. I think Mertens plays behind him. I think maybe the I think maybe Politano starts. I think we're going to start to rotate a little early. Because after the international break, the games start to come like two or three a week for almost two months straight um, once Europa League starts. Because because instead of it being every other week, it's every week for them to catch up because it's starting late. So I think you see Politano start. I think you see Osimhen start with Mertens. I think you see Deme start with one of either Fabian or Zielinski. If it's me, Fabian deserves to be benched this week because he played like crap last week. So I would start Deme and Zielinski. And then I would hope that Rui is starting with Koulibaly, Manolas, and Di Lorenzo. And then Medet starts in goal, even though I don't know what's going on with that. And that's a whole other thing with Napoli fans. What's going on with the goalkeeper? <laughs> Why isn't there a play? To me... I don't care as much because I just want us to win. So if Ospina's the guy, Ospina's the guy. And if Medit's the guy, Medit's the guy. It, it, to me, it's secondary to me. So whoever starts at goal, as long as they don't make a dopey error, I'm fine with it. But I think that uh, I think that's pretty much what we do next week. I think we go aggressive. We try to score some goals and get that confidence going in because our next game after that, just like last year, is Juve. And we got a big game in the third week, so. Listen, it's good to get those games uh, early, uh, you know, maybe, uh, you know, shock the system early, uh, those big games. But uh, I, I don't know if, I, again, I forget if, uh, if, if it was already mentioned uh, by you guys, but uh, Napoli makes uh, champions next year quickly. Yes. Yes. Okay. So they make top I, four again. I think 100%. they make top four. 
I think they okay. make top four. I think if if anyone does out there who listens to you guys, all listens also listens to Far from Vesuvius, we don't really do over the air predictions of Napoli just because we're <laughs> Neapolitan and superstitious. That's it. Um, but I do think that they finished top four this year. I think that uh, one of those top four teams from last year is going to take a big dip. And I think one of Atalanta or Lazio is going to take a big dip this season. If I was betting, I would say Lazio because I just don't think they've they've reinvested enough to handle Champions League and Serie A. Um, and I think, but I do think it's going to be a battle. I think there's five or six or seven teams that can all be fighting for that those top four. I think obviously Milan is in the mix this year. Um, I, my, cons- my concern if I was a Milan fan would be how do you guys cope if Ibrahimovic misses any time? And if you do guys get Pioli at some point, <laughs> because he does tend to uh, lose his teams after a little while, even though I do like Pioli also very classy dresser. I respect that. Um, yeah. And I, I, I wonder if Atalanta can keep the steam going. I mean, they very much resemble the same team last year, and sometimes you wonder if things stagnate a little bit. And you know, they've been on a good run for a while. And I, I do leave, I do believe the door is open this year for not only the Champions League race, but I do believe that there could be a chance that we have a Scudetto race. I know last year everyone oh. looked at the table, and years from now, saying, "Oh wow, Inter only was." You know, missed the Scudetto by one point, but we know the truth that this Scudetto was over weeks before that, and they just yeah. pulled the, pulled together late. But I, I do think that I do think that Juventus have an issue this season. Um, we don't know what Pirlo is going to bring them as a coach. You know, he just got his coach's badges ten days ago or a week ago, right before their first <laughs> matches, and I, and I do think they have a little bit of an issue at striker. I mean, I know they just brought back Morata, who I hate so much. Gosh, do I hate that guy? Oh shit! But, okay, <laughs> he's, he he is he is perfect for Juventus. Yeah, he's exactly. Just I like just, him as a striker. He's a good number nine. He's just he's just easy to hate. Gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think that at striker they you know obviously Ronaldo is R- Ronaldo, but I think that that train does start to lose steam at some point. And what is your option after that? I know that I mean obviously. Once Dybala is, is back and into the groove, he's someone who just I feel like sometimes people forget about him, and then he has a streak where he scores 10 goals in five matches or 10 goals in six matches. But I do think there is a little bit to be had in the season this year. I don't know what team that's going to be. I know everyone wants to jump and say Inter is going to be that team this year, but Inter going to Inter, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> No, very, very well said. I think I think Ken was like uh, was mysteriously like hearing us when because uh, some of these points like we were mentioning earlier on in yep. the podcast, Ken had yep. some insight before. <laughs> I don't know where if he had a signal over there in Boston uh, from here in Montreal, but uh, but no, great, great insights like always. Away. Ken. Yeah, no, maybe he heard us. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, I did. Yeah, I heard you guys very, the whole time. That that's it. It's very possible. But uh, Ken, uh, honestly, one before we let you go we want to say a big thank you from all three of us uh for taking the time to, to come on uh you brought some great insight uh, now we're two out of the three uh far from vesuvius co-hosts on we had uh, rafa the man rafa uh you know last season now we had you we we're waiting for marco i guess uh yeah uh, you're waiting next for marco up, i don't know yeah what's the idea boy about too, marco so. yeah come on yeah. you guys gotta you know a whole you guys can get a toronto boy in. you guys can you know <laughs> A little yeah. bit of banter. But, yeah, I mean, yeah. listen, I appreciate the time, guys. I, I, I love coming on to a, to a non-Napoli-specific cultural podcast and talking because, I, I obviously, I'm a huge Napoli fan. But, you know, I think everybody, once you once you have one team or you pick a team, you're always following the league yeah. uh, as a whole and you like to see the happenings. And, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk about any of the teams in the league. So I would do like to come out here and, and you know, get on with it other podcasts when I can, because I just love to talk about the league and it's been an, it's been a really, really good time. So I'm, I'm glad you guys took the time out. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. You guys know where to find us. Uh, I know you guys are, are in our predictions league, so Absolutely. that's going to be fun this season. It's, uh, you know, that's, that's a brainchild of Rafa. And I was like, dude, this is such a great idea. 
Which, so by the way, I was listening to the end of your podcast and I was like, yo, these guys are going to make this happen for sure. When Rafa said on something, I feel he's that type of guy that he said on something, it's going to happen. And, and you guys delivered. Yeah. By the way, uh, Adri, uh, Rafa announced uh, in the podcast yesterday that the, the Genoa uh, Verona game, uh, sorry, Verona Roma game doesn't count. Uh, it's Lazio Atalanta. That's the second game of the yes. of the prediction league. Yeah, of oh, course. So can, can you can you want to you want to air out those details uh, for for all our listeners? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so go ahead. Was involved. Yeah, so we we were pick, we're picking two games a week uh, that a bunch of the Calcio podcasts are involved in. Too many for me to remember to mention. There's a whole thread <laughs> of on Twitter, but yeah, um, a lot. I mean, there may be like eight or nine of us are all involved, and in, you know, it's just something to get. For me, it's important because I want us to sort of build a community together. I want us all to be able to, you know, get into chatting and more often because I see a lot of us, you know, we're all going in the same direction and I think it's good just to link up together. I mean, you know, there's so many sure. good Calcio podcasts out there and I feel like there's a new one every couple months that comes out and is <laughs> putting out great work. So Rafa decided, hey, let's pick two games a week and we'll predict. Of course, the first game we predict has a crazy circumstance where Roma basically has to forfeit the game for um, misregistering a four Monopoly player, Amadou Diawara. Yeah. Um, so we have to basically pick a different match because we just, I just didn't think it, we didn't think it would be fair to either keep the points as they were or, or give everyone zeros. So we just switched it um, to Atalanta Lazio. So I think that it's good. I think it's truly sort of like the quote unquote game of the week anyway. So I think yeah. it'll give everyone an opportunity to sort of, have a little bit of a redo and you know of course that's the way it works but i think we'll get the second uh the second week matches out of the next day or two and when we'll roll on we're going to get a spreadsheet going and then at some point we'll uh we'll talk to all the other podcasts involved and we'll decide on what we want the uh the prize to be there's got to be we, 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 we got to be working for something here so i mean <laughs> me and rafa are, are are also big wrestling guys so i was like yo we need a belt yeah, we'll put, put on the, the belt, put on the belt. We get a belt and we can just, you know, ship it to the winner and we can figure it out from there. But it's make it know. that nice, sexy, white intercontinental title type yeah, of belt. Ultimate, ultimate Warrior style. Let's go. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think it's going to be fun. I mean, obviously we love, I mean, anytime we can get a little bit of friendly banter involved, it, it's good too. So I think it'll be fun this season. Uh, it's something we just, Rafa thought of just on the cuff and, I was like, let's roll with it. So it's going to be fun. It's going to be an exciting season for sure. It's going to be, I think it's, Serie A is going to be crazy this year. I think every year it turns out to be a little wild, but I think this year there's a, there's a lot of pieces in the mix to make it a really exciting one. So I'm definitely super, super pumped for not only Napoli, but all of Serie A this season. Absolutely. And, uh, and Ken, uh, again, just before we let you go, uh, we, we definitely love uh, the words that, that you said about, you know, bringing this community together. Uh, we're a big part. We're a big believer in that here at the Cultural Guys. Uh, I mean, I remember when we had that day from Milan Club Philadelphia, uh, president over there, he, he, you know, we were saying we got to get together. And Nick was like, how about a UV fan? He's like, everybody's welcome. So we just love that community that uh, Cultural Twitter seems to bring. Uh, you know, sure. I think we're all in this together, uh, and uh, you know, it, it's a good community to have. Yes, we might not like all the same teams, but I think we find a happy medium, uh, you know, with the with the league itself uh, that we love and, uh, and that we're passionate about. But again, Ken, before we let you go, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. And if anybody of our listeners are living under a rock, uh, where can uh, where can they find you and uh, and your podcast? Yeah, I mean, so we're Far From Vesuvius uh, podcast all about Napoli. Uh, you can find us on Twitter at Far From Vesuvius. We also have an Instagram, which is at Far From Vesuvius podcast. Click any of those and it'll have all of our hosts' personal Twitters if you want to talk to us. Obviously, we we try to get involved as much as we can. You know, everyone's super busy and getting on with our normal lives. We try to be as connected as we can. So For obviously, sure. if anybody wants to reach out to us or, or talk to us, you know, feel free to, to just hit that ad and, and, and start, start chatting because you know, we're, we're here and we're around. So we hope you guys listen to our podcast, listen to the couch. guys get involved. <laughs> you know, we're all sort of in this community together and we want, all we want to see is, is us help up grow the sport in these sort of English speaking communities so that we can all, you know, everybody can enjoy it together and somebody, everybody has somewhere they can go and has a little bit of a safe space in their own their own calcio land, you know, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and you said it right, uh, yeah, Ken. And uh, we're 
perfectly said, honestly. And uh, where you guys can find us, just like always, at The Culture Guys on uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook as well. Uh, catch our podcast on all your favorite podcasting platforms. And uh, we'll be back uh, next week to talk a lot more culture uh, in the Serie A. Thanks for joining us again, Ken, and uh, thanks for listening. Ciao. Of course. Bye. <laughs>